Uh, let me add my squiggly so that we don't accidentally go past. And you remember what we talked about last time. Last time we talked about metric spaces. Today, um, all we're looking at is now some properties of metric spaces. So we'll just be pretty much proving a bunch of theorems about metric spaces, things we know about them. Uh, and then that will be the end of metric spaces here, and we'll move on to a topic of topologies being connected. Uh, there is one more section of metric spaces that at the end of the year we can come back and do. Uh, it's a section basically determining whether or not a topology is metrized, metro, I'm not going to say the word right, determining whether or not you can generate a topology from a metric. So that's what the next section is about. So we can come back at the end and do that section if you guys want, if that's something that interests you. So keep that in mind for how we decide to finish once we've covered just the basic material. Uh, anyways, so properties and metric spaces, uh, we'll just start proving that they have them and introduce a couple definitions as we go. So first thing we're going to prove is that Metric spaces are always Hausdorff. Do you remember what Hausdorff is? Because they have a neighborhood around. Maybe stop for a second and explain how this sentence even makes sense. Every metric space is Hausdorff. Hausdorff is a property of topological spaces. How does it make sense to talk about a metric space being Hausdorff? Isn't every metric space Every metric space gives us a topology. Yeah. We can induce a topology from a metric space. Do you remember how we do that? Do you remember what our basis is? So this was a good place to start. Our basis elements are the set of all open balls. So if you give me the metric space XV, then I make my basis, maybe I'll write it out all the way, my basis would be the set of all open balls such that x is in big X and epsilon is a positive number. So pick any positive number you want and pick any point in there. Create this open ball. That's one basis element. A basis element is a set of all the open balls we can generate this way. Are we confused by the open ball? A little bit. Still? Okay, let's do that. So what is the open ball B, D, X, epsilon? Now D here is your metric, right? Yeah. Do you remember what a metric is? Maybe you should start there. What's a metric? It doesn't it give so it's a function from x or from r cross r to function from x cross x to r. Yeah. You give it two points in x and it spits out the distance between them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's always spitting out a distance, a positive number. We could have written it this way if we wanted. Zero to infinity. Small thing to fit out to zero. Right? So, now what is the open ball using this metric centered at x with radius epsilon? Why do I say radius? Because we might not be talking about a circle. We could be using, for example, the taxi cab metric. Yeah. Taxi cab yeah. metric, what's the distance from here to here? Is this distance plus this distance? It is not this distance. Right? Mm -hmm. So, what is this set? This set is a set of all y in x, all the points in x, such that the distance from x to y is less than epsilon. So let's dry out some open balls real quick using some different metrics to help you see it. We'll always do it in R2 since that makes sense for our whiteboard. So here we are, we're in R2. Let's draw an open ball using the standard metric or using the Euclidean metric. What does that look like? If this is a point x, that open ball looks like exactly what we expect, something with radius epsilon. Okay, let's look at the taxi cab metric. What does the taxi cab metric look like? That looks like where x is right here. 
Do the same way I did the well, except the side. So this distance right here is epsilon. This distance right here is epsilon. And if you pick any point here, the distance from here to here, this distance plus this distance is epsilon. Oh, yeah. That one make sense? Yeah, if I force you to always move in this grid-like motion, you always have to go straight right or straight up, then this is the furthest you can get. But covering epsilon, when we think about it over here, we could have gotten a lot further because we could have just gone diagonal. We could have gone all the way to here before we went epsilon. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other one that we talked about was, I think it was called the max metric, where you look at what's bigger between this displacement in the x direction and this displacement in the y direction. Yeah. And that one's going to be real simple looking. There's x, where this distance right here is epsilon. These are all the points whose max distance is epsilon away. So it's like this same one except for we fill in like that. So this is a bigger set. Because we only count one of the distance, so we can get further away, only going the same distance. <laughs> Sorry. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying if I would have drawn that epsilon to the same scale, we would have gotten something intuitively much bigger than this, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not much bigger, but twice as big. Okay. So that was three different metrics that we talked about in R2. Once you pick your metric D, then you can define an open ball using that metric. Here's an open ball using the Euclidean metric. Here's an open ball using the taxicab metric. Here's an open ball using the max metric. We're calling all these things open balls. Don't be confused by the fact that they don't actually look like a ball. There's no geometry in topology. Okay. So, there's a bunch of different open balls. Now, what is our basis? Our basis, so if we're talking about R2 and this D, we're talking about R2 and uh, the Euclidean metric, all our open balls look like this. And so you take all the open balls that you can possibly make, and all the unions of open balls, that's our topology. That is generated by the Euclidean metric on R2. Make sense? Yeah. Similarly, if you would take the taxicab metric, if this was your D on R2, then all your open balls are these things. And your basis elements are all the possible things like this that you can make. And your topology is the union of all possible things that look like this. We're going to prove that these two things generate the same topology. They give you the exact same open sets. And we already did something kind of like that earlier. Similarly with this, your basis elements would just look like this now. Feel like you understand where we're at right now? Yeah. Good refresher for what we did last time? Okay. So, let's hop back into what we were actually proving and make, make sure what we're trying to prove actually makes sense to you. Every metric space is house dwarf. So now we understand what we mean when we say every metric space is house dwarf. We use the metric space to generate a topology. We're saying the topology is Hausdorff. Did we forget what Hausdorff is? A little bit. A little bit. Every point has its own neighborhood. If I have two points, x and y, in my topology, then there exist separate neighborhoods, u and v, such that those neighborhoods don't intersect. Do you remember what a neighborhood for a point is? Isn't it just an such, I mean, the union of open balls? No. A neighborhood is just an open set containing the point. What's a neighborhood of x? It's just an open set containing x. That's all it is. So another way of saying that topology is how Dorf is, pick two points, I can find two open sets containing those points that don't intersect. How's Dorf? Yeah. It's just useful to use a terminal, the neighborhood terminology to help you remember what how's Dorf is because it sounds like how's Dorf. Yes, I would expect you to. Most of the time, that's the thing everyone remembers. House yeah. Dorf. What's House Dorf? Separate neighborhoods. House Dorf. 
Okay, so now we're proving every metric space is Hausdorff. So I'm just going to say proof. I'm just going to keep writing the proofs right here and erasing them as we go. I'll just go down the list. Good with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're proving this. So proof, we're proving this. I don't need to write that there. One, we need a metric space. So let x be, be a metric space. Be a metric space, comma, I think that's all I'm going to say. So let x e be a metric space. Two, I'm trying to show it's house door, so what I need to do is grab two arbitrary points out of big X and show that they have separate neighborhoods containing them, right? Mm -hmm. So let little x in big, well, let's write both of them at the same time. Let little x and y be points in big X such that x is not equal to y. They need to be separate points. We don't want to accidentally grab the same point twice. Okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, here's x, here's y. I'm going to say, let epsilon equal the distance between x and y. So now this right here is epsilon. With me so far? Mm -hmm. I'm going to create an open ball around x. I'm going to draw it as a circle, but it doesn't matter how we draw these things. It's just typical to draw it as a circle. I'm going to take, so that is epsilon. I'm going to draw it down here a little bit. So I'm going to take the open circle around x, the open ball around x with radius epsilon halves. I'm going to take the open ball around y with radius epsilon halves. And I'm going to show that a point being in both those sets leads to contradiction. Therefore, they don't have an intersection. And the contradiction I'm going to use is going to be, it's going to contradict the triangle of equality. Because if a point is in both of them, if z is a point that's in here and it's somehow in here, then the distance from here to here plus the distance from here to here is going to be less than epsilon. Which is impossible because the distance from here to here is epsilon. So I can't add up the distance from x to z to y and get something less than epsilon. I have to get epsilon or more because of the triangle of equality. Yeah. That's a big picture of what we're going to do here. So, three. Uh, let epsilon equal the distance between x and y, comma, and assume by way of contradiction that there exists z in the ball centered at x with radius epsilon halves intersected the ball centered at y with radius epsilon halves. Notice that these balls are open sets because they're, meant, they're basis elements. Yeah. They're basis elements so they're open sets. So these are going to be two open sets containing these points that don't intersect. Assume by way of contradiction that there's a point in their intersection or in other words that they do intersect. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, the distance. Oh, it's going to be the easiest way to show this. Well, wasn't we'll right. Then the distance from x to z plus the distance from y. From z to y, maybe I'll write that way so we can think about it as one path, but metrics are symmetric, so it doesn't matter what order I write them. That's that. This is going to be less than, less than, not less than or equal to, less than epsilon, epsilon halves plus epsilon halves. Because since z is in here, then it must be less than epsilon halves away from x. And since z is in here, then it must be less than epsilon halves away from y. With me on the algebra so far? Yep. So the distance from x to z plus the distance from z to y is less than epsilon halves plus epsilon halves is equal to epsilon is equal to the distance from x to y. Contradiction. Because we're contradicting the triangle of equality. We just barely got that the distance from x to z plus the distance from z to y is less than the distance from x to y. We know that the distance from x to y is always less than or equal to the distance from x 
to z plus the distance from y to z for any z. It doesn't matter what z is. This is always the case. We just barely show this. This contradicts this, in other words. You see it? Yep. Anything weird? Um, just to clarify, we know that this works for any type of distance, not just Euclidean like you're showing. For any metric. Because the triangle inequality. The triangle inequality showing. holds for every metric. Okay. Yep. So nowhere here are we actually using anything Euclidean. I just use that for my picture. We're always just referencing the metric D, and we know the fact that D satisfies the triangle inequality. Any other questions? I, you know how we finish it from here, right? Therefore, these things don't have, these things intersection is empty, therefore they're open sets containing those points, therefore the sets have sort. Okay. Yep, I think you know how we finish it from there. So that's the first proof, and let's do the next proof. The next proof looks a little bit messier. Hope we can do it. Oops, didn't even erase the proof. So now let's do proof of. Maybe write what I'm proving here so I don't forget what to reference. So now let's prove 5.13. Alright, so let's see what it says and maybe draw a picture if I can see how to do it that way. So let x and a metric on x and y and a metric on y be metric spaces. Then f from x to y is continuous. Remember what it means for function to be continuous? That is intuition for basic calculus and does not work for a split second here unless we happen to be in those special cases. We spent a whole section on continuous functions and homeomorphisms. In topology, continuous functions have the simplest definition ever. Yeah. <laughs> a function is continuous provided that the pre image. Of open sets are open. Alright, let's run. Here's X, here's Y, topological spaces. So they have some association policy, right? T sub X, T sub Y. We have two topologies. We have a function, F, from X to Y. How do I know if my function? Do you understand the picture so far? Is there anything? Yeah. Too high level? Okay. So we have a function from this topological space to this topological space. How do we know if f is continuous? What do we do? We come over here and we look at y for any open set. Pick any open set. Take anything in there. Any member of this topology. Call it u. Here's u. All we know about u is it's a member of there. We look at the pre-image of u. So here's the pre-image of u f inverse of u. What do we mean by the pre-image of u? We mean all the points that map into u under this function. The pre-image. Okay. So here's u, it's an open set. We look at its pre-image and we say, is this set in here? Is the pre-image open? So we look at everything in here, look at its pre-image and see if that's something in here. If it is, our function is continuous. If we can find a single thing in here, such that its pre-image is not in here, then the function is not continuous. It has to be the case that for everything in here, its pre-image is something in here. Not everything in there, just something in there. Everything in here, when you look at its pre-image, just has to be something in there. Okay. They can all map to the same thing in here, that's fine. Or they could all come from the same thing in here, that's fine. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a continuous function. So now I forgot what we're doing. We're proving that if a function is continuous, so if I know that the pre image of open sets are open, then I'm going to show uh, the epsilon delta definition of continuity using any metric. So that's what this is basically saying. So let's read it and make sure we understand it. So f from x to y is continuous, if and only if. Maybe draw my picture here again so that we can uh, see what's going on. So here's x, here's y. We're saying f, which goes like this. 
is continuous if and only if for any x you pick in here, for any x you pick in here, for any epsilon, so pick x and pick some open ball around it. Oh, no. Sorry. For any x you pick in here, we're going to take its image. Here's f of x. That's right here. We're going to create an open ball around here with any radius you want, any epsilon. So for any x and for any epsilon around, for any x and for any radius around f of x, there exists a delta, so we're looking for the delta, we're looking for the delta, such that the image of this is a subset of this. So another way to think about it, if you're confused by the jumping back and forth, you can almost think about it as, for any f of x you pick over here, and for any epsilon, there exists a delta over here such that the open ball with delta, when you take its image, is a subset of this open ball. So yeah. f of uh, the image of the open ball using d sub x over here, right? This is x with d sub x, and over here we have d sub y. So the open ball d sub x, centered at x with radius delta, is a subset of b d sub y, centered at f of x with radius epsilon. So pick any f of x and epsilon you want and create that open ball. If it's the case that I can always find this open ball, such that its image is a subset of the open ball you chose, then f is continuous. We're proving that's an if and only if. Okay. So let's read it up here one more time to make sure it makes perfect sense. So f from x to y is continuous if and only if for every x, notice that once you pick an x, you also get f of x. For any x and for any epsilon you choose, there exists some delta such that x prime being within delta of x, so x prime is a point over here, x prime being within delta of x implies f of x prime is within epsilon of f of x. So we're saying if x prime is in here, then f of x prime is in here. That's exactly how we would show that this thing is a subset of this. Take something in here, it's in here x prime being within delta of x is the exact same thing as x prime is in this open ball. What's this open ball? It's a set of all points within delta of x. Is there any confusion in going from this to this picture and what we're trying to prove now? No. Feel like you got it? Yeah. Wonderful. So, let's see if we can actually figure out the proof. So, uh, maybe write a let up here, and then we'll do our arrow. Let, we want that to be a big X, big X, DX, and big Y, DY, B, metric spaces. Okay, so we'll prove this way first whichever way that is. Uh, assume, oh, and we need to state f. Oh no, we don't need to state f. Yeah, we do. So let those be metric spaces, comma, and let f be some function from x to y. So now we're going to assume f is continuous. And show that implies this property holding, and then we'll do the other way. We'll assume that this property holds for x, and show that implies that. We'll assume this property holds for f, and then show that implies f is continuous. So let's go the first way. Assume f is continuous. Okay, we're assuming f is continuous. That means, maybe put our picture, but put it up down here. You have space right above it. There 
here's y, there's x, here's f. Since I know that f is continuous, I know that if I pick some open set over here, call it v, then its pre-image, call it u, is also open, where f of u is equal to v, or uh, u is equal to the pre-image of v, whichever way you want to write it. So that's what I know, that's what I need to use. So assume f is continuous. Now what do I need to prove? I need to prove that for any x and for any epsilon you choose, I can find a delta such that this holds. So we need to pick some arbitrary x and some arbitrary epsilon. So assume f is continuous. Let x in big x comma, and let epsilon in r plus. So pick any x you want and pick any r plus you want. My job now is to find the delta. Uh, let's see. Continuous, da da da. Then for all that, there is just a delta. So I need to find the delta. So let x and x, let that, that, comma, and let, can I call it v on here? Let v be any. Open set containing No, that's not what I want to say. And observe, I need an open set over here, and observe that the ball using metric d sub y, d sub y, centered at f of x, with radius epsilon, is open. Okay, so what have we said so far? So I said, you pick any x and epsilon you want, my job is to find the delta that makes this true. So whatever x you chose, doesn't matter what x you choose here. X maps to something. It for sure maps to some f of x, right? Mm -hmm. And then whatever epsilon you chose, I am now constructing this open ball with that radius epsilon that you chose. My job is to find a delta over here such that the image of this is a subset of this. You with me? Yeah. Okay. Since uh, f is continuous, we'll call the open set u, comma, u equal to the pre image of the ball using dy centered at f of x with radius epsilon is open in x. So I know whatever the pre-image of this ball is, whatever that thing is, calling it u, who knows what it looks like, I know that its pre-image is for sure open. u equal to that is open, comma, and, just make this very explicit, and x is in u. x is a point in u. Yeah. Okay. So, what do I know? I know that u is an open set and x is a point in u. Back to the theorem we did last time, we showed that a set is open in our topology generated by our metric if and only if for every point in the open set you can create an open ball around it that's a subset of the open set. So let me do that in standard bar 2 for a second to help you realize it, or to help you make an intuitive connection. 
So using standard R2, pick any open set you want. Okay, that's an open set in R2, right? We know it's an open set in R2 using the proof we did last time. If and only if, for any point you pick in here, doesn't matter, I can find an open ball containing that point, such that the open ball is a subset of the overall set U. How does that lead to U being open? The union limit. If for every point in U, I can find an open ball containing that point, that's a subset of U, then I do that for every single point in U, union up all those open balls that we get, you get U. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the intuition behind it. So, since F is continuous, U equal to the preimage of this open ball is open in X, and x is in u, which gives me that there exists some delta such that the open ball, we're now in x, centered at x with radius delta, is a subset of u. Right? What does that give me? Then that gives me that the image of that ball there that x with radius delta is a subset of f of u, which is equal to this ball. b, b, y, f of x, epsilon. Which is exactly what we wanted. We spread the show that the image of this open ball is a subset of this open ball. Uh, I'm still a little confused on how you got when you say x is in u and then you go straight to the delta such that it's so, a subset of u. I know that u is an open set. Yeah. And I know that x is a point in it. Okay. U is an open set in some metric space. Just like u being open in R2. I know that if I have an open set in a metric space, then for any point inside, that open set, I can create a small basis element containing that point, centered at that point, that doesn't go outside the set. Okay. So here's my u, here's my x, here's my delta. So, since x is a point in u, there must be some delta, there must be some small enough number such that when I create the open ball with that really small number, we're still completely inside U. Okay. Okay. So, if this is a subset of U, then the image of this is a subset of the image of this, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we have here. Okay. And what is the image of U? It's this open ball. U was defined to be the free image of that open ball. Yeah. So the image of U by definition is that open ball. So this is a subset of that open ball. That's exactly what we were trying to show. We are trying to show that we can find some small open ball over here, so that its image is a subset of any open ball over here you choose. So that backwards. Pick any open ball you want over here. Our job was to find a small enough open ball over here, such that its image is completely contained inside the open ball you chose to begin with. That's what we've been trying to prove? Yeah, that's what we just proved. So now how do you do it the other way? Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> Gotta start writing. Okay, so let's go the other way. Hopefully we have enough space here. If I write so hard, we should be fine. Five. We're going this way now. So we're going to assume for all x in x, and for all epsilon greater than zero, we're in positive R. There exists a delta greater than zero, such that this holds. We're assuming this. We're assuming the right-hand side of the if and only if. Now, I'm going to rewrite this implication a little bit different, just because I think it will make the proof more clear on how we can do this. So such that the ball centered, the ball with dx centered at x 
x with radius delta, when you take its image, is a subset of the ball using dy centered at f of x with epsilon. That is essentially what this implication arrow says. Same thing as this hand group. If x prime being with the delta of x implies that f of x prime is within epsilon of f of x, that's the same thing as x prime being in this open ball leads to its image being in this open ball. Mm -hmm. So all the points that satisfy this property also satisfy this property, or all the points in here, when you take their image, are also in here. You see how those are the exact same thing? I think that that's honestly the hardest part of these proofs is going back and forth between this thinking and the open ball thinking. I don't know. My own feeling, who knows, maybe we'll get stuck here. Maybe we'll eat those words. Okay, so I need to show that f is continuous. How do we show a function is continuous? We need to show that the pre-image of open sets are open. So I need to pick any arbitrary open set, look at its pre-image, and prove that its pre-image is open. Okay, so next we'll do let v be any open set in Y and let U equal to pre image. I'm just naming these things, assuming that I may have to use them a lot. So once again, maybe we'll scribble a picture in this blank space here. We have Y over here, we have X over here, we have F going like this. I did that backwards. We're going from X to Y. I know that V is open here. I'm looking at U, its pre-image, and trying to figure out if U is open. If U is open, our function is continuous. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let V be any open set in Y, and let U be the pre-image of V. Let x be any point in v. So here's my thinking on how I'm going to do this. Oh, x be any point in u. Here's my thinking on how I'm going to want to do this. I need to pick some random point x in here. And I need to show that I can find an open ball containing that point that's a subset of u. If I can do that for every point in u, maybe draw this one bigger real quick. So u is some open set like this. Or some set. I'm trying to show u is open. Let's put u out here. I'm trying to show u is open. How can I show u is open? I'm going to pick any random point in u you want, call it little x. And I'm going to show that I can always, for any point x in there, I can construct a little open ball containing x that's also a subset of u. If I can do that for every point in u, then the union of all those open balls is going to give me back u. So U is a union of open balls, therefore it's an open set in the metric topology. Does that make sense, big picture, what I'm going to do here? I think so. Okay, so let's do it. So let X be any point in U. Uh, let me see. Let X in U, what does that give me? That gives me that f of x is in v, right? Mm -hmm. Now, since f of x is a point in v, and since I already know that v is open in y, I know that there exists some open ball around f of x that's a subset of v. The property we're trying to show u has, we already know v has, because v is open. The only question is, is u open? Okay. So since V is open, I know for any point in V, I can find an open ball around that point that's completely contained inside V. Right. So, let X in U, that gives me F of X is in V, which gives me that there exists some epsilon such that the ball in Y 
centered at f of x with radius epsilon is a subset of v. Eight. By assumption, comma, there exists delta in R plus such that this holds. Such that f of b d x centered at x with radius delta is a subset of b d y centered at f of x with radius epsilon, which I know is a subset of v. Okay, let's follow all that for a second. So, what did I do? I said, since so these open, then over here, here's f of x. Since v is open, then there must be... I really wish that was bigger. I will draw it bigger. Here it is. Here's our v. We'll just make it almost take the whole set so that we have room to write. And here's some point f of x in there. I know that since f of x is in v, this is v, and then this is y, y v, f of x is point here. Since f of x is a point in v, then there must be some radius I can create around this point such that that open ball stays completely inside of v. Call that radius epsilon. So pick epsilon, then that open ball is a subset of v. With me? And then we have x over here. Here's x, f takes us like this. By assumption, what was our assumption? We assume that for any x and any epsilon you choose, okay, we found one, the x that goes to f of x, so x is some point here, x is the point that goes to f of x, for any x and for any epsilon you choose, there must exist a delta such that there must be some delta here such that this open ball, when you take its image, is a subset of this open ball. That's what we said here. By assumption, there exists a delta in R such that the image of the ball centered at x with radius delta in x, using x as metric, is a subset of the ball centered at f of x with radius epsilon. That's using our assumption. Good? Okay. Okay. Which is a subset of v. Obviously, that open ball is a subset of v, right? Mm -hmm. So that gives me that. Since the image of this is a subset of V, then this thing itself is a subset of the pre-image of V. Yeah. So that gives me that the ball in X, centered at X with radius delta, is a subset of the pre-image of V, which we call the U. Now we're something. Now we just really show that for any X you choose, pick any X in U you want, I can find an open ball containing that x that's still completely inside of u. That gives me that u is open. And that gives me that f is continuous. And we're done. Good? Anything weird until I finished up? Not until I finished up. It's just kind of a mouthful. It is kind of a mouthful, but the picture... The picture helps. Isn't all that bad. We're, we're good with the top part of the picture, so let me just erase up here and draw this picture bigger. And hopefully tie it all together nicely. So what do we have? We have x over here, and we have y over here. What do we know? I know that for any open ball you pick over here, essentially, I can find an open ball over here such that the image of this is a subset of this. Yeah. That's my assumption. So that's what I know I can use. Okay. So what did we start with? We said, over here, pick any open set you want, call it B. 
There's B. Call its pre-image U. Who knows what it looks like? Here's F inverse of B, which is equal to U. Same thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that U is open. So what do I do? I pick a point in U, call it X. Pick any point in U, call it X. What do I need to do to show that U is open? I need to show that for any point I pick here, I can find an open ball containing that point, such that the open ball still sucks out of U. Imagine I did that for every point in U. For this point, I found an open ball I did go outside of U. For this point, for this point, for this point, every point in U, union up all those open balls, what do I get? U. Just U. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, then U would be a union of these open balls. That's exactly what it means to be an open set in our metric topology. Your union of open balls. Your basis elements are open balls. If you're a union of open balls, you're an open set. If you're a union of basis elements, you're an open set. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, all that remains to do is find this open ball around X. If we can do that, we're done. Okay. So that's what we need to find. Oh, we haven't found it yet. We haven't found it. So we're saying here's x, here's f of x at some point over here. Now, since f of x is in v, exact same thinking, since f of x is in v and we know v is open, then we know that there is an open ball okay. containing f of x that doesn't go outside of v. Yeah. And we said we'll call its radius epsilon. Okay. Now, what did we know by assumption? We know that for any open ball here, I can always find an open ball here that maps entirely inside of here. That was assumption. Right. So here's an open ball Y. I know by assumption that for any open ball Y, I can always find an open ball with X with radius delta, such that the image of this thing is completely contained inside of there. So now I have an open ball containing X. The only question now is, is X, this open ball containing X a subset of U? If it is, then we're done. I found an open ball containing X, but that's not enough. I need an open ball containing X that's a subset of U. Well, how did you find it? How did I find that it's an open ball? How did I get this open ball, or how, how do I show it's a subset? How do you know, how do you show that it's uh, in U, the ball? Yeah, so that's the last thing to show now. How do I justify that this open ball is in U? The way that I justify that is this image of this open ball, which is this ball, or smaller, is in V. And U is the pre-image of V. U is everything that maps in V. This whole ball maps inside this whole ball, maps inside V. So this ball maps inside V. U is a set of all points that map inside V. All the points in this open ball map inside V. Therefore, this open ball is part of U. So it's a subset of U. That makes sense. Cool. And that's all we did. A lot of jumping back and forth between topologies, but I think the underlying thinking is not too bad. It's just a lot of notation. Right? Very abstract course. <coughs> okay. Is that the second proof? <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Let's chug away. I guess it'll take some time to jump back in, but I won't take near as long to do the rest of these. Okay, our next definition is a very straightforward definition, and it's a definition that gives us a distance between two sets. Now I'll tell you what it is intuitively, and then we'll go back and look at the definition. So let's just say we're in R2, and I've got this set, and I've got this set. And I want to know what's the distance between them. We're going to say that the distance between them is the distance from here to here. That's the distance we can. We're going to say, look at all the points here. Grab a random point here. X, grab a random point here. Y, calculate their distance. And do that again for every possible combination of points that you can do. The minimum value you get for only their distance. <laughs> or it's the minimum distance between those two objects. If you think about the objects that set the points. Same thing. Almost. One site technicality. This thing doesn't really include its edge. So 
So the minimum distance between them might not actually exist. So we say it's the smallest num it's the greatest number less than their minimum distance. Take all their distances, take its greatest lower bound, that's its distance. I didn't get that. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> greatest uh, lower bound? Let's think for a second. So let's look at a set just on a number line. So here's the set, it goes from zero to one. And then here's two, and here's three. They're open intervals. What's the distance from one to two? One. We're defining it, in this case, we're defining it to be one. But notice that that isn't quite the distance from exist. a point inside of here to a point inside of here. Right. Okay. We did from a point, the first point outside of this set to the first point outside of this set. That's your weird technicality. So the distance between these two sets and the sets if we were to include these points is going to be the same. And including that point doesn't change the distance between those sets. That's the one we're kind of got to. Other than that, it's perfectly intuitive. Wait, can we go over that again? You say like, if it is including, then it's one. If it's not including, it's one. So. How do we get the distance between this set and this set? We pick two points in there and calculate their distance. And we do that for every combination of points we can possibly do. Take the minimum value we get, that's our distance, right? Mm -hmm. Almost, because they might not have a minimum value that you get. It's kind of like asking, what is the minimum value in this set? Zero to one, not including zero. What's the smallest number in that set? Uh, zero is not in there. Oh. What about one half? What about a fourth? What about an eighth? What about sixteenth? What about thirty second? There isn't one. There is no smallest number. Right? Yeah. So there is no two points in these two sets that are the closest points. I cannot find x in here and y in here such that their distance gives us our minimum distance. Those points don't exist. The same way that I can't pick the point Going from here to here, if we're looking just on R, what's the distance between those? I can't pick the point in here and the point in here that give me the minimum distance. That point doesn't exist. That's asking for what's the biggest number in here and the smallest number in here. What is the smallest number in there? There isn't one. What is the biggest number in there? There isn't one. Pick any number you want in here and I can always find one bigger. So you're saying there's a minimum distance between two sets, I mean, yeah, between two sets, but there isn't. There is a minimum distance between these two sets. We're, we're defining the distance between right now. What is the distance between those two sets? We're saying take the least upper bound. Least other way, lower greatest lower bound for all our possible distances. So in other words, for any point in here you pick x, and for any point you pick in here y, the distance between them, I know for sure, is always greater than 1. Right? Yeah. It's also always greater than 1 half. It's also always greater than 0. Find the biggest number I can possibly find that it's always greater than. That number, in this case, is 1. And that's your minimum? And that's your distance. Oh, okay. That is your greatest lower bound. These are a bunch of different lower bounds. This is your greatest lower bound. We call it your emphemum in calculus. Greatest lower bound. And it's a proof of calculus that every bound set has an emphemum and is, has a greatest lower bound and a least upper bound. We call them your emphemum and your supremum, so I might actually say that. So if I say emphemum versus supremum, say no, nope, re-say it. You know. Say it in terms of terminology that you'd understand. Okay, but it gives you the distance that you expected. You expected the distance between those two sets to be one, very intuitive. You just need to remember that one set didn't quite have a max element and one set didn't quite have a least element. So you can't pick the two points in the sets that minimize the distance. Yeah. Those points don't exist. You can just get arbitrarily close to making that distance one. You can get as close as you want, and so one is what we're going to call the distance. Okay. Okay. So, let's
Let's read the definition now, and we'll see that that's exactly what it says. Let xd be a metric space, and let a be a subset of x, and b be a subset of x. A, b. Then the distance between a and b is defined by, the distance between a and b is equal to the greatest lower bound, greatest upper bound, no, I had that right, greatest lower bound, is equal to the greatest lower bound of the distances between two points, between two points A and B, where A is any point in A and B is any point in B. So pick, we use X and Y here, but we're saying pick any little A in here you want, pick any little B in here you want, calculate their distance. Now to do that again for two more points, do that again for two more points, do that again for two more points. Make a set of all the distances that you get. Now, let's look at it, greatest lower bound. That's what we're going to call its distance. The same way that one was greatest lower bound for when we had it like this. Okay. Okay. Very intuitive, but a little bit tricky when you're actually working with improves because of that case that you can't find those two points that minimize the distance necessarily. Okay. So let's notice some weird properties that distances between sets have. First off, if the distance between two points was zero, what does that mean? They're touching. They're the same point. The distance between two points is zero. Oh, between two points, sorry. Between two points, yeah. But now, exactly like you said, they're almost touching. They don't necessarily have to touch. They just have to get arbitrarily close. <laughs> we'll look at that really quick. Okay. So in R2, look at this line segment crossing this line segment. They touch at this point. So their distance is zero. Right? Yeah. Over here, let's look at A now. A is an open ball. It doesn't include its perimeter. So get rid of its perimeter, and you're left with just an open ball. And then the point B, or B, is some line segment tangent to its perimeter. So B doesn't actually intersect A, but gets arbitrarily close. The distance between them is still zero. Okay. Here's another way to think about it, to make it just come all the way home, hopefully. Here's R2. Ignore all our pictures. Here's R2 right here, right? I'm going to take R2, and all I'm going to do is remove one point. We'll call that point little a. I just took little a out. Okay. So now what is the distance between R2 minus little a and the second thing is little a? Here's two sets that do not intersect, right? Mm -hmm. One has everything but little a, one just has little a. What's the distance between those two sets? Zero. It better be zero, right? Does that bring back intuition? Yeah. So, same thing going on here. Okay. Okay. That's the definition. And then we'll prove probably the most useful theorem of the section. Yeah, probably. That one's a course. Um, let's just read it. So let D and D prime be two metrics on X. So now we just have X, now we don't have two separate metric spaces. We just have X and we're defining two different metrics on it, like the taxi cab metric and the Euclidean metric, both on R2. So let D and D prime be metrics on X that induce, top, that induce topologies tau and tau prime, respectively. So D induces the topology tau, or generates it, I think is the terminology they used earlier. And then D prime generates tau prime. With me so far? Yeah. Okay. What are we going to prove? We're going to show that if tau prime is finer than tau, remember the notion of finer versus coarser? I remember us talking about it. What intuitively is finer? When it's broken up into smaller pieces, right? Yeah. If it's broken up into smaller pieces, then there's more sets. Mm -hmm. If it's all in one piece, then there's no sets. It's just one big set, right? So if it's all one, our coarsest topology is just this. There's our coarsest topology. And our finest topology is this. Yeah. Right? So... 
Is this a subset of this, or this a subset of this? That's a subset of that. Top's a subset of the bottom, right? Yeah. Which one's finer? Bottom. This one. This one's a lot finer. Mm -hmm. So the less fine is a subset of the finer. Okay, let's go back to this. The less fine is a subset of the finer, or tau prime is finer than tau, if and only if, for every x and for every positive number, probably going to be using what we had up here, there exists a delta such that, okay, uh, let's get a picture of this really quick. So, here's how tau breaks up x. So this is x, but tau is a collection of subsets of x, right? So maybe it breaks it up like this, and then breaks those each in half like that. So there's the subsets. doesn't break it up very much. Let's look at tau prime, though. Let's say tau prime does something like this. Much finer. Whatever. A lot more pieces, right? So what are we saying? We're saying that... This one's tau prime. We're saying tau is a subset of tau prime if and only if for every open ball I can find over here, I can find a smaller open ball over here that is completely contained inside that thing. This picture is a terrible picture. Think about how this quality works. Uh, let's try this again. So we're saying tau is a subset of tau prime. This is the case if, maybe we should have written what we said first, if the ball using d prime's metric is a subset of the ball using d x epsilon. Okay. So here's the open balls generating tau. Right? We are saying that if, if I can use smaller open balls than the open balls used by tau, I get a finer set. Maybe that's the intuitive way to think about it. If I use smaller open balls, I get a finer set. Yeah. So if I can show that for any open ball I use to generate this set, I can find a smaller open ball completely in, contained inside of it that generates this set, then this set is a subset of this set. That's what we're proving. We're showing this implies this. So we're showing if this is true, then this. Uh, well, you're showing both, aren't you? No, we're not showing logically equivalent. We're just showing that this implies this. The other way is definitely not the case. Well, it says if and only if right there. Oh, is the other way the case? We'll have to prove it. So I guess this is if and only if. Now, uh, one of those is not intuitive to me, so we'll prove it both ways and make it work. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, let's have at it. See what we can do with this. Okay, so this is proof of... Before we start, do uh, you want to explain to me why this is the most useful theorem? Um, it's going to give us a way of showing that two topologies are equivalent. Showing that this is the case isn't that bad. And so notice that this being the case, these open balls being subsets of each other, gives me that this is a, this is a subset of this. So if I can find an open ball like this that's a subset of this, then that gives me this is a subset of this. Mm -hmm. And then if I flip it, I can find open balls the other way, then that flips it that way, and then I've shown that those are actually the same topology. Okay. So that's how it's going to be useful, is showing us that topologies are the same. And we can now use to this way of checking that topologies are the same when their topologies generate by metric spaces. So topologies generated by metric spaces, we have a much easier way of checking if they're the same than having to find the homeomorphism. Finding a homeomorphism is not trivial. I don't remember how to do it, so. And that's because there is no standard way on how to do it. And you can't even be convinced that there is a way to do it to begin with. So first what you do is you make sure there aren't some obvious properties that both your topologies don't have before you even try to do it. Because you're just
just having to come up with the function that happens to work. Oh. So, don't want to start writing that big. This is an if and only if. We're probably going to need lots of space. Who knows? Maybe it will turn out to be real easier. 5.15. Okay. Well, let's start with our let, I guess. Let d d prime be metrics on x inducing tau, tau prime, respectively. That's a B. You understand what we mean by respectively? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two. So that's our let. Now to our uh, if you only if proof. Well, two. Assume that, which way do we want to go? That tau is a subset of tau prime. So what am I trying to show? Assume tau is a subset of tau prime, comma, and let, let's see, what am I going to have to let to prove this? So I'm trying to show that for any x and for any epsilon, I can find a delta that makes this true. So I also need to let x be some arbitrary point and epsilon be some arbitrary value. So assume that and let x be any point in x and epsilon be any point in r class, any positive number. Okay. So, let's see. X and epsilon. Then, I know that B with X epsilon, the ball centered at X with epsilon, using D. As our metric, this is an open set in tau, right? This is a basis element for generating tau, and therefore it's an open set. Okay? So I know that this is in tau prime. Because tau is a subset of tau prime. Maybe do it one step at a time. So I know that since this is a basis element, then this is in tau, which gives me that, which is a subset of tau prime. Maybe that's the way to connect it all together. Which then gives me that b with d at x using epsilon is in tau prime. So whatever this thing is, it's an open set in tau prime. Right? Oh, using our theorem from last week, same theorem we've been talking about over and over again. If I have an open set in a metric topology, and I have a point in there, then I am guaranteed that I can generate an open ball around that point, completely containing our open set. There we go. So, or, then there exists delta such that the ball d prime at x delta is a subset of the ball d x epsilon. Because this is an open set in T prime, mm -hmm. and since T prime is a metric topology, then for every point in there, namely x is a point in there, I can always find a radius, call it delta, such that the open ball in this topology, so now we're using D prime, the open ball in this topology is a subset of an open set in this topology. This is an open set in this topology. This is an open ball in this topology. So there exists an open ball that's a subset of the open set. That wasn't bad at all. Okay. So we just showed it. Now we got to show the other way. So maybe the other way will be harder. That was easy. Okay. Uh, bye. Let's go this way. Assume that for all x, for all little x in big x, and for all epsilon in r plus, comma, there exists 
ball centered at using B prime. Using D prime. He had D prime to prime one. D prime at X with delta is a subset of the ball just using D now. Make sure you notice that there's a prime there. And this is just D. X with epsilon. So what are we assuming? We're assuming that using a metric D for any open ball you can create around X, I can always, using metric D prime, find an open ball contained inside of it. That's what we're assuming. What am I trying to prove? I'm trying to prove that every open set I can generate with these open balls, I can also generate with these open balls. Or I'm trying to show that tau, the topology generated with these open balls, is a subset of tau prime, the topology generated with these open balls. How do I show that tau is a subset of tau prime? I'm going to pick an arbitrary element out of there and show it's in there. Good? Mm -hmm. So, six. Oh, okay. This is easy. Let u be anything in tau. Right? Let u be anything in tau. And how do I want to say this? Let x be any point in u. And let x be any point in u. Pick any point in there we want. Here's the big picture what I'm going to say. So I've got u. Here's u, and I know that u is an open set in tau. I'm trying to show it's open in tau prime. Right? Yeah. What does it mean for u to be open in tau? It means it's a union of open balls using our metric d. What does it mean to be open in tau prime? It means it's a union of our open balls using metric d prime. So I need to show that for any point in here x you choose, I can find an open ball around it using a d prime open ball, using our d prime metric, such that this open ball is a subset of u. If I can do that, then we're done. I know by assumption, so since u is open in tau, and since x is a point in there, x must have been, well then I can create some open ball around it using my metric d to get my op this open ball, using metric d, right? Mm -hmm. By assumption, if I have this open ball, I can create one using d prime to get a smaller open ball. That was by assumption. And so that's how I'm going to do it, to get all my points. So let u in tau, and let x be any point in u. 7. Since u is in tau, I don't know if I want to say that. We'll write it down, just to help do it at home. Since u is in tau, or in other words, since u is open in topology generated by the metric d, there exists epsilon such that the ball using d centered at x with epsilon is a subset of u. Right? Since u is open in the topology generated by the metric d, I can find an open ball containing x that's completely inside of u. We've used this like five times today already, just feel like. Same property. Yep. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Eight. By assumption, there exists a ball using d prime now, centered at x with radius delta. There exists this ball. That's a subset of this ball. I don't want to have to rewrite the ball twice. <laughs> By assumption, once I have a ball that looks like this, I can find a ball using my other metric completely contained inside of it. That's what we're assuming. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nine. Then, for all x in u, comma, there exists, uh, maybe throw one more thing on here. This is also a subset of u. Let me check that. So then for all x and u, there exists an open ball using d prime centered at x delta, centered at x with radius delta, such that 
d d x delta is a subset of u. I was fairly shown how for any point x in u you pick, I can find an open ball using my d prime metric to contain that point and still have it be a subset of u. So then u is equal to the union of all those open balls. Or in other words, u is in tau prime, which gives me tau is a subset tau prime. And we're done. Good? Mm -hmm. I think so. Can't really see the lead, so I can't ask. Based on that. Okay. So, that is that proof. Uh, maybe we won't take the time to do this next proof because it's going to take some algebra. I'll show you how, uh, how you would do it with just pictures. And then I think you'll see why the algebra might not be the funnest for the proof. Proof of 5.16. We won't actually do it, but we'll draw the picture, so I, I would guess that you wouldn't be able to do it on your own. So we're going to prove that the standard and taxi, the standard metric and the tax cap metric give the same topology on R2. Okay? How am I going to do that? Let me use this theorem twice. I'm going to show that I can find open balls with the taxi cap metric that are always subsets of open balls with my standard metric. Therefore, the standard metric is a subset, or the standard topology is a subset of the metric cap topology, and then vice versa. I'm going to show that for any, I can't remember which one I said first, but just vice versa. Here's what the picture looks like. I saw for any open ball you pick with the standard topology, here's an open ball centered at x. I can find an open ball with the taxi cap topology completely contained inside of there. And that one would be easy. We could just use the exact same epsilon. So here's my open ball in the standard topology. Here's my open ball in the taxi cap topology. This thing is a subset of this thing. Therefore, we just really showed that the taxi cap topology is finer than the standard topology, or we just really showed that T standard is a subset. Oops, other way. No, that was right. T standard is a subset of tau taxi cab with this picture. We showed every taxi cab. Uh, you have that right. Yeah. The taxi cab is a subset of the standard. Yeah, because the taxi cab's inside of the standard. It's finer. It has smaller things making it up. So it has more sets. This thing has more sets than this thing, or maybe the same. Because I can use smaller things to do it. Look, what would intuitively give me a finer topology? Open sets like this, or open sets like this? The bigger one, right? Would give me a finer topology? A finer one? Yeah. One that is less coarse? One that has more pieces? Look, what's finer, a rock or sand? Sand. Sand. To get this open ball, with these open balls, I've got to take this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. I've got to use a lot of sand to reconstruct this rock. Wouldn't that mean the rock is finer? Coarser. <laughs> sand is finer than a rock. We need a lot of sand to get a rock. Yeah, but all of those small sands make up the rock, so wouldn't the rock be have more stuff in it? No, because the rock is a rock and you can't break it up into fine grained pieces like you can break this one up. <laughs> Once I keep unioning these things together, I'll eventually get the circle, but it was by unioning a bunch of pieces together. You can take sand and you can glue a bunch of little pieces of sand together and eventually get a nice big boulder out of it. That doesn't make it coarser. It just means you're holding all the sand together to get your rock. Is that a bad analogy? The smaller the pieces, the finer it is. Right? Yeah. The smaller the pieces, the finer it is. We're showing that for any small pieces you use for this one, I can find smaller pieces for this one. Okay. Okay, I see it now. 
Therefore, this is finer than this. For any pieces you can find for this one, I can find smaller pieces that make up this one. So this one's finer. And then I may show the inverse of that, therefore they're the same find. It might help if you show me what the inverse looks like. Because I'm still not. The here. inverse picture, we're going to do the exact inverse. Gonna be the we're going to start out with this. Here's an open set in the metric topology, centered at x. We need to now find an open ball smaller than this. The, the natural one to take is the one that's actually uh, tangent to the edges here, but you can do smaller if you want. You don't have to make it hard on yourself. So I would start out with this one, which this right here now is epsilon. Now I have to be careful, more careful about how I pick this. What's that going to be? Epsilon over square root of 2? And then over here, we can just use the exact same epsilon. Let's fill in the one that we start, the one that we finish with. So we add this one. So we start with the dotted line, and then we found the solid line as one smaller inside of it. But they're both open. Don't be confused by one solid, one smaller. Yeah. So over here, we're showing that the taxi cab topology is finer than the standard topology. Over here, we're showing that the reciprocal of this, or the inverse, whatever you want to say. We're saying that for any basis element you use for the taxi cab, I can find a smaller basis element that's used in the standard topology. So standard topology uses smaller basis elements than this does. Over here, we said standard topology uses bigger basis elements. Bigger are the same, smaller are the same, so they use the same. But they're the same topologies. This we showed this, with this we showed this. So this being true implies this is true. This being true implies this is true. Well, actually, we showed they're logically equivalent. Turns out. But you show that both of them are logically equivalent? This being true is logically equivalent to this being true. Here's one that pointed that out to me. This is an if and only if proof. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But that's just a lot to do in one proof. But showing this to show this is what was very intuitive to me. If you can show this, you can show this. This way to this way, and that was not intuitive to me that I was just going to look. Turns out I did. So that's how you do it with this one. And it's just going to be the algebra of making these calculations. And working with the absolute values here. So, but that's the picture that you can use, just for the sake of time. Well, move past that one. Because that's the only one that's more like an example proof than an actual theorem that we need. So let's see, we'll move this. Maybe I'll keep writing in the same area. We'll just move it. So I don't want to go over here, actually. Oh, no. All right. Stay in this area. And let's continue our, our definitions and oh, only one more proof. I thought we had two more. Definition 517, let xd be a metric space, then a as a subset of x is bounded under d, provided that there exists some mu. That mu is just, uh, historically, that's what's used. We could have picked any letter there, it's just a variable. Nothing special about it. We could have said epsilon, we could have said delta. We're just using mu. So let x d be a metric space, then A as a subset of x is bounded under D, provided that there exists some really big number such that for any two points you pick, their distance is never bigger than that really big number. Some of them end. So what are we saying? We're saying a set like this in the real numbers with the standard uh, metric is a bounded set with the Euclidean metric. How do we know it's bounded? Because the distance from one point to another point in the set is never bigger than, I don't know what this distance is, we'll just pretend that this was a distance of 20. So it never gets bigger than 20, the distance between two things. If I can find some way that's bounded like that, then it's a bounded set. Let's look at one that wouldn't be. Imagine we're still in R2, and we look at all the points in this open set. Notice that 
there isn't some number that bounds the distance between any two points in this open set, right? Yeah. For any number you pick, it doesn't matter how big of a number you pick, if you pick something like 10,000, okay, let's pretend that we're way zoomed out so that this is 10,000, and this is zero, we can pick this point and this point. Their distance is more than 10,000. For any big number you pick, I could buy two points whose distance is more than that number. So it's not bounded. So a subset of x is bounded, provided that there exists some upper bound between the distances between any two points in that set. With me so far? By upper bound. Upper bound, some number that the distance can get higher than. Okay. So an upper bound for human height is 20 feet. No human can grow more than 20 feet. They also can't grow 19 feet, but 20 feet is still an upper bound. 2,000 feet is an upper bound for human height. So you don't need to find some minimum upper bound. You just need to pick some upper bound. We can find one. So that's an actual number. Infinity doesn't count as a real number. So you can't pick that. Good? Okay. Now, if the entire set X is bounded under D, then we say that D is a bounded metric. So if our entire set X, we can't come up with if our entire set x, we take the two furthest points away that we can possibly find from each other, and they're still less than some number, then our entire set is bounded by the metric. So the real numbers are not bounded by the Euclidean metric, right? But if x was just, now we're just talking about, I create a topological space on, let's see, what's the topological space that we've used a hundred times in this class? Uh, we've done like the annulus, right? Look at the topological space x on the annulus. And we use the Euclidean metric. The distance between any two points on the annulus is always bounded. Right? Mm -hmm. But however, if we were looking at R2, then the distance between any two points is not bounded. So here's one that's not bounded with the Euclidean metric. Here's one that is bounded with the Euclidean metric. Any questions on that? Okay, here comes the really cool proof. Let xd be a metric space, and let d prime, so it's going to be a second metric, let d prime from x cross x to r by d prime of x and y is equal to the minimum of dxy and 1. So d is a metric. We're creating a second metric, d prime. And what distance does it give you? It gives you the distance between x and y if that distance is less than or equal to 1. Otherwise, it just fits out 1. So you say, what's the distance between the point? Well, we'll just randomly draw one. What's the distance between this point and this point using d prime? It's 1. Then it's just using the distance between x and y that this already did. Okay. So we already have some metric, like the Euclidean metric. We're creating a second metric, d prime. And what does it do? If the distance between x and y with our existing metric is less than or equal to 1, it just spits out whatever that function was already spitting out. If the distance between x and y with the metric we already have is greater than 1, then this new metric is only going to spit out 1. Right? Okay. Now, I'm calling this thing a metric already, but we haven't proven it's a metric. We'll need to handle that. But surprise, surprise, it's a metric. But here's what we're proving. The d prime is a bounded metric that induces the same topology as d. What? Okay. Really? So, yeah, let's get very concrete with this. This is a very surprising theorem. And if you're not surprised, then you're probably not understanding it. Let's look at the Euclidean metric on R2. The Euclidean metric on R2, how do we calculate it? We say that the distance between x and y is equal to, uh, let me call it p and q so that we don't get confused with the x1, x2 again, and y1, y2. p and q, where p is equal to the point x1, y1, and q is equal to the point x2, y2. Right? So 
So then the distance between P and Q is the square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. Squared. Right? Just pipe back in here. Where's me so far? Mm -hmm. So with this metric, then the distance between a point like this and a point like this is very different than the distance between a point like this and a point like this. Right? Mm -hmm. This is much bigger than this. We're now creating a new metric that pretty much does this. It says, okay, we'll start at some point x. What are, we're going to talk about all the distances from this point. We're going to say, if all the points are within a radius of 1, there's a radius of 1, then we'll say their distance from x is the exact same thing as the Euclidean metric. So what's the distance from here to x is still just 1. What's the distance from here to x is still just a half, or whatever it is. With me so far? Everything works as expected. Now, outside the circle, so up to and including the border, we can include the border. We're saying, now what's the distance from x to this point? 1. Same as its distance to this point. Same as its distance to this point. Same as its distance to this point. As to this point. As to this point. As to a point way, way, way to the right. You with me on what this metric is doing? Yeah. Okay. Crazy thing. The metric that is induced by the Euclidean topology, the Euclidean metric, gives us the exact same topology as this new metric does. Isn't that weird? It is weird. Kind of, until you think about it long enough. And then you realize, oh, since they behave the same locally, and since they behave the same with things that are really close together, and topologies only care about proximity, uh, it makes sense that they don't really change the topology. Because <laughs> their local behavior is still the same. And their behavior far away, not locally, is radically different. Does that mean you can exchange the number one for any number that the same shape? Yeah. One is just some constant. You have nothing special about the number one in that. It gives up the minimum between this and pick anything. And it would still be the same. As long as there's a positive one. Okay. So that's what we're going to prove. And we're going to be using this theorem over here, theorem 5.15, the one that we already referenced, for showing two topologies are equal to do it. Okay. So let's get to work on the actual proof. Uh, this is theorem 5.15. Okay, so what do we need to get started? Let one. Let X D be a metric space. And let D prime from, which can be called X squared to R, by D prime of X, Y is equal to the minimum of the distance between x and y by our given metric and 1. Right? Just writing down our givens. Well, we okay. also have to prove it as a metric. Don't we? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Let's prove that d prime is a metric. Uh, maybe we won't include it in our proof. We'll just list out the three properties real quick to make sure it makes sense. So what's the first property of a metric? If I'm not d prime of x, y is equal to 0, the only way that that can be the case is if the distance between x and y is 0, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that equaling 0 implies that the distance between x and y is equal to 0. But since this is a metric, that implies that x is equal to y. And this is an if and only if. We can go both ways on that. So that's the first property. The distance between two points is zero if and only if they're the same point. Oh, we didn't really show another part of this. D prime is always greater than or equal to zero. was the first part. This was the second part. This is always, well, you can see it's always greater than or equal to zero. We know that this is always greater than or equal to zero, and one is greater than or equal to zero. And it can only spout these values. Therefore, it can only spout values greater than or equal to zero. Well, we kind of write that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So d prime satisfies the first property of a metric. It's always greater than or equal to zero, and it's equal to zero if and only if they're the same point. 
That's property one. Property two is symmetric. And that means we don't even need to write down property two. We already know that this one's symmetric. And this being symmetric only depends on this being symmetric. We already know that this is since this one's already symmetric. So this one's also symmetric. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the third one is a triangle inequality. Um, let's see. We've got two cases for this one. So, let's see. So I need to show that, maybe write what we need to show up here and then I'll write some work down here. I need to show that the distance from x to z is always less than or equal to the distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z, sorry, using uh, the prime metric. I already know d satisfies triangle inequality. I need to show what d prime does. Okay, so we've got two cases. If dxy, no, not prime, if dxy is greater than or equal to 1, or dyz is greater than or equal to 1. Maybe I could just say it rather than writing it. If this is greater than or equal to 1, then this is 1 for sure, right? Yeah. And if this is greater than or equal to 1, then this is 1 for sure, right? So if one of these two is greater than or equal to 1, the sum over here is 1 or more. Mm -hmm. With me? By definition, the biggest this thing can be is 1. Right. If this is the case, then this has to be 1 or more. The biggest this can be is 1. This has to be 1 or more. Therefore, this is greater than or equal to this. That's the first case. Good? Right. Now we got the second case. Less if dxy is less than 1 and dyz is less than 1, then uh, let me see how I want to make sense of this. Then dxy plus dyz, I know that that is going to be less than or equal to dxz. So I know that this one already satisfies the triangle inequality. It's just going to be these same things. Yeah, it's just going to be the same thing, so it already does. But I also know that d prime, okay, so this, there we go, I figured out how to connect this. So writing the triangle inequality for d, just need more space on that. So I know that d already satisfies the triangle inequality, so I know that this is always the case. But in this special case, this is the same thing as d prime, xy plus d prime, yz. And then notice by definition that d is always greater than or equal to d prime with the same thing. Right? D prime can only be smaller than D. It can't make it bigger. Because it has one as its min. Yeah. Or because it's taking the min between the things. So it either spits out what D did, or if D spits out something bigger than one, it just spits out one. So there it is. So it satisfies the triangle inequality. Because this is less than or equal to this. Okay, so it's a metric. <coughs> and now I forgot what we were proving. The topology is in this one. Okay. Two. Let tau b, let tau, tau prime be topologies induced by d b prime respectively okay now so
show up in theme for a second. Which way do we want to show up first? Maybe I'll write, even though this isn't an if and only if, I'll write an arrow to help me think about which way I want to use first. So first I may show that tau is a subset of tau prime, and then I'll do the other way. So, let u be any member of tau, and I need to show that that thing's in tau prime. Uh, no, that's not how we do it, actually. We're going to use our theorem over here. Uh, use our theorem over here. Okay, uh, let's see. So I need to pick an open ball. I need to pick an arbitrary open ball using one metric and show that I can create an open ball that's a subset using the other metric. Therefore, we get one way and then vice versa for the other way. So I need to grab a random open ball using one metric and show I create a smaller open ball using the other metric. And do that for both metrics, and then we prove that they're subsets of each other, so they're equal. I think that's the right way to do this. So let's do that. Let B, we'll start with D, X, Epsilon, B, N, E, So let's see, we have two cases here. We have a case where we have x and we have epsilon, where epsilon is less than 1, less than or equal to 1. In that case, I could just like delta equal epsilon. But if we do it in a case where it's bigger than 1, then we restrict ourselves to 1, and we're still good. So, for let delta equal the minimum of epsilon and 1. And I'm trying to show, trying to use this to show that the ball using d prime centered at x using delta is a subset of the ball using d centered at x with epsilon. That's what I'm trying to show. If I can show this, I'm done for the first leg, well, right? It feels like you already showed it. Uh, I drew a picture of it. No, I, I mean like that one's. No, because these are using different metrics. And so just because I know one distance is smaller than another doesn't mean it's completely contained inside of it. I see. Yeah, so if only it were that simple. I think I might have to break this up into two cases, which I really don't want to do. But let's just do it. Assume epsilon is less than 1. Then b d prime at x with delta is equal to b d prime at x with epsilon is equal to b d with x at epsilon. If our metric is always less than 1, if we're always talking about distances less than 1 from them, then our metrics give us the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So, if epsilon is less than 1 and delta is the minimum of epsilon is 1, then delta equals 1, right? Or sorry, then delta equals epsilon. Delta is the minimum of these two things. If epsilon is less than 1, then delta is equal to epsilon, right? So the ball with d prime centered at x with radius delta is the same thing as the ball with d prime centered at x with radius epsilon. 
And now, since our metric functions are the same for values less than 1, this and this are the same. Follow it there? So now we need to handle the other case. Now assume epsilon is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, maybe we'll say less than or equal here, because in that case they're still the same, right? So we'll just worry about epsilon greater than 1 here. So if epsilon is greater than 1, oh, then we're still the same up to 1. So then, so yeah, this works. So if epsilon is less than 1, well, that gives me that the ball using d prime with x up to 1, if we stop ourselves at 1, this is still, well, I'll put my delta in first. My ball centered at x with delta is going to be my ball d prime centered at x. Ooh, no, no, no. This has to be less than. Once it's equal to 1, then we can get all sorts of things that aren't the same. So this is over here, we're saying delta. Oh, do that backwards. Now assume epsilon is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, so then our ball at delta is equal to it at 1 is equal to all of R or all of X or all of R two. No, that's not what we want. the other way real quick and then come back this way so let b d prime be any open ball Then B D centered at X with radius one is going to be uh, maybe I can just go all the way and you can see it. B D prime. Oh no, I need to take the minimum of one and epsilon. Uh, so basically what I did before. So four, let delta equal the minimum of epsilon and one. Then B D X with delta. the two cases just like we did before because I should have just switched my balls and done everything else the same. Um, so isn't, yeah. isn't uh delta prime supposed to be the minimum of the two? Not delta. No. The prime just refers to metric. We'll reuse x and epsilon when we go to prove the other way. Okay. So now if Epsilon is less than one, then B D X delta is equal to B D X epsilon 
is equal to b d prime x epsilon. Right? We know how these things behave the same for distances less than one. So delta is the minimum of one and epsilon. If epsilon happens to be less than one, then our delta is our epsilon, and then we know both of them behave the same, less than one. Exact same thing we used before. Twice that I should have just left out there. But here's the easy one. If epsilon is greater than one, oh, so we could just use epsilon. Delta equal to epsilon. Anyways, it doesn't matter. If epsilon is greater than 1, we're just going to set delta equal to epsilon here. So we don't have to think about that minimum. Just set delta equal to epsilon. In this case, it's still true if epsilon is less than 1. If epsilon is greater than 1, then b d centered at x with epsilon. Our open ball is still for sure a subset of R2, right? Yeah. But here's the crazy thing. This is equal to B D prime at X1, which is for sure going to be a subset of B D prime. They're going to be equal, but they're a subset of X epsilon. What are all the points a distance 1 away from X? Every number. By definition of our metric, right? That's the furthest a point can get away is 1. So R2 is the set of all points 1 away from x, which if you say more than 1, then you still can only get R2. You can't get more than R2. So increasing the distance doesn't change anything. Increasing our minimum distance. So that way was what was easy. But now we still got to figure out going the other way. So now the other way. Wow, I slammed it a lot in a row. Draw a line there. And now I see the other way. I was really hoping to have an epiphany along the way. Didn't work. Okay, so now, oh, so this is a subset. D was a subset of D prime, which gives me that. Tau prime is a subset of tau. Using our theorem over there. Let's not forget that we're trying to set these two things are equal. Okay, so now I need to figure out the other way. So now we need to say let B D at X epsilon be any open ball. Now, if we stop our open ball from ever reaching one, then it's either going to be the same or smaller. So just pick a number smaller than one. Let delta equal the minimum of epsilon and some number one half. Some number smaller than one. I don't want delta ever reaching one because our function goes crazy when delta reaches one. So let delta be the minimum of those. Then we have two cases. If epsilon is less than one half, what does that give me? That gives me b d prime at x with epsilon. If it's less than one half, it's for sure less than one. So, oops, delta is equal to b d prime at x with epsilon, since we're going to be equal in that case. If epsilon is less than one half, the delta is just epsilon. So, delta is going to be epsilon, which is going to be the exact same thing as b d x epsilon. And so I got that this ball is a subset of this ball in that case. If 
epsilon is greater than one half, or equal to, that gives me that BD prime at x delta is going to equal BD prime at x with one half. And remember that this, when we have a radius smaller than one, is the same thing as b d switching from d prime to d x with one half, which is now going to be a subset of b. Okay, that wasn't bad. B x epsilon. So then once again, we have this thing is a subset of that ball. Okay, so our problem was we were just trying to use the number one rather than a number smaller than one. Yeah, it seemed a lot easier. So that gives us. In this case, what did we show? We show that the standard is a subset of the prime, right? And before we show the prime is a subset of the standard, therefore they're equal. So they generate the same topology. Picture in R2 showing how this works, so I don't think we really need that example. Uh, and then our last definition for metrics, unless we come back to it later. So our last definition now. So you'll notice these two metrics gave the exact same topology, and yet they're drastically different metrics, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's another the same way that we have a notion of two topologies being the same, two topological spaces being the same by a homeomorphism. We have a notion of two uh, metric spaces being the same via uh, isometric. And an isometric is stronger than a homeomorphism. So if I have two things that are isometric, then they're for sure homeomorphic. But being homeomorphic does not imply isometric. So let x dx and y dy be metric spaces, and let f be a bijection from x to y then f is uh, f is an isometry provided that for any two points you pick the distance in x is equal to the image of the distances in y it preserves distance mm -hmm. you take the distance between two points and the image between the distance between those two points, and it's the same thing. It preserves distance. The distances stay the same. I take the space, I map it, my distances between points after mapping it, still the same. That's what I'm saying. So, in the same way that we had, if a homeomorphism be exists between two sets, or two topological spaces under homeomorphic, same thing. If an isometry exists between two metric spaces, then they're isometric. So, another way of preserving the structure. So, another structure that we talked about now, uh, metric spaces, and another structure preserving map that we've talked about, showing that two things are isometric. Uh, a bijection means that it's uh... one to one and on two. Okay. Yeah. But that's it, so we'll be starting, I think, connected fault.